A very good afternoon for all present over here. This is Dipika Nandanwar back again with a very interesting topic and very close to our heart. The topic is Into the Heart of Himalayas by one and only Jono Linen. Jono Linen is a curator at the National Museum of Australia. Jono was the first person to traverse the Western Himalayas walking solo 2700 kilometers from Pakistan to Nepal. Sir, research interests are in creativity and storytelling and how the body can be medium, a catalyst and a framework to generate both. Sir was born in Belfast, Northern Ireland at the start of the troubles, moved to Canada as a young boy and spent almost 20 years traveling the world, working as a forester, zoologist, key racer, deep sea fisher, mountain guide, humanitarian relief worker and writer. His books include the River Trilogy, Into the Heart of Himalayas and Perfect Motion. Also having our dear moderator, Alvira Divan. Alvira Divan is a clinical psychologist by profession. She has her own clinic in Nagpur by the name Psych Work. Pam is also an avid reader and a passionate writer. Her articles are published in both print media as well as digital media international. She believes in right to heal. Currently working in the field of women empowerment and development for the society and is associated to various NGOs in Nagpur. Now I would like to hand over this session over to you guys. Thank you for the kind introduction, Deepika. Uh, a very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an absolute honor for me to sit here and have a conversation with a man whose journey has been more of a kind of a pilgrimage. This is what he quotes it as. And uh, this is what I have been through reading couple uh, pa from the past couple of days. Uh, I believe the best of knowledge that we can get as individuals is some from someone's uh, experience of life rather than reading it in theory. Because they have been through it uh, in a practical way and they can explain it better, uh, better with their mistakes and with their uh, experiences. Uh, Mr. Jono Linen here has taken on a solo journey uh, and it has been a journey full of experiences which gave him uh, self-awareness and which healed him, which have uh, been a process of healing for him as a person. Um, and uh, the best part of it is that he has written it in a manner that anyone who would read it would experience the same intensity of emotions while going through it. Uh, the time that I was reading the book, I was feeling like I was the one on the experience, on the journey. So I think that's the best part as a writer. And uh, a writer can write best when they have been uh, in their most vulnerable phase. You know, and uh, he was in that phase. Uh, when he uh, wrote this journey. Um, this session is going to be really inspiring. This is what uh, has inspired me in the past two days and I'm equally enthusiastic as passionate as he is. Uh, as Dr. Mranali uh, Nayak has very rightly said in her inaugural speech yesterday that uh, this online literature fest has been more like a blessing in disguise. You know, we are sitting in two continents, uh, two different continents in different time zones. Yet we are talking about something which, uh, which has healed him and which will be a, a process of motivation for us as viewers. Uh, so I really welcome you, uh, Mr. Jono Linen. Uh, on the Oran City Literature Fest and uh, we look forward to a great time of learning with you. Welcome, sir. Alvira, thank you very much. That was that was a beautiful introduction and um, really I'm just so happy that, uh, that first of all you were able to read the book but secondly that it resonated with you and what you said there that you felt you were on the journey with me because ultimately that was my aim, you know. I went through a process of, as you said, self-awareness and eventually healing. And my hope is that people who face the same situations as me, and everybody will, they can they can they can draw from they can draw from the knowledge that I gained during that trek and in the writing of the book. So thank you very much for that. 
definitely sir and plus this topic is so much related to us in today's world because uh, we are confined to our homes you know mm. this pandemic has been a time when we are restricted our movements are restricted and in a uh, and in this phase we are learning about your experience of the great mountain greatest mountains you know the great okay. himalayas so uh, this my first question to you my very first question to you is about the same you know trekking in the himalayas for 2700 kilometers is just something it is like indeed an accomplishment which has to be celebrated by anyone uh, but as we all know it isn't a fake walk <laughs> yes. yeah. so as someone who isn't into trekking i can say that it has to be one of the most dangerous and one of the most difficult task that anyone could come across in their life you know so uh, my first question to you is what made you decide on taking the route wow well that's a question about motivations and action and um you know that's something that is worthwhile for everybody to consider so why did i undertake this trek you know initially i thought that i was undertaking this trek because i you know i was a young guy and uh you know i had a lot of ego and i had a lot of testosterone and i had a lot of i had a lot of um i had a lot of faith in myself and what i was really thinking about at the start at a superficial level was that i wanted to do this to become the first person to walk the length of the western himalayas alone because when i was a kid when i was a little boy my idols included great mountaineers like chris bonington and reinhold messner and google has to people like that and i thought well if i undertake this trek then you know i'd be considered in the same in the same vein as them now as you know from reading the book alvira my initial motivations were definitely superficial and they didn't relate to my understanding of the trek at the end of the trek and then you know through the 12 years of actually writing this book that was you know i talk about the first journey being the one where i actually walked that 2700 kilometers but the second journey of this story was the writing of the book and you know the self therapy that that brought me through amazing sir uh we know that you have been on this trek alone you know as a psychologist i know that human beings are social beings they need constant support and plus being at a place at this high altitude with uh, many of the physical tensions there uh, and in addition the most important thing is in in addition to what you have been through you know the trauma of losing your younger brother how did you cope up with the solitude there and why did you do matlab why did you take a solo trip was it something that you were looking forward to well uh You know, first of all, I will say that on the trek, I was never more than three days on my own without some type of human interaction. Because uh, you know, a lot of people who have been in the Himalayas will know that there's many, many small villages. Uh, some of them still not even connected by road uh, to the rest of India. So. Um, you know there was never more than there was never more than a few days before i didn't have any interaction with people now i'm a person who is fairly comfortable being alone and i would say that the, a lot of that comes from the fact that uh you know i spent years as uh an international ski racer so you spend a lot of time training alone and you become you actually become very comfortable with 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 yourself and also you become very very comfortable with the feelings in your body like you know you know if you're you're pushing yourself too hard so for me undertaking this alone yeah i mean the firstly uh a i was comfortable being alone and b someone else had actually walked as a group the length of the himalayas a few years before me so if i did it with a group 
Um, if I did it with a group, then uh, you know, it wouldn't have been the same. It would be. What be the, the difference? It would have been. Would have been. Well, it would have been very different. And a couple of things that I understood as I went along in the trek was that for me, walking alone actually became a great advantage. And that was because um, when I went into a village, people took me in. You know, I was a single, I was a single man with, uh, with, you know, no, no, no need to, to take anything from there. Um, I was someone who, the fact of the matter is that right across, right across the Himalayas, right across India, the nature of people is to be generous. The only host are hospitable. Yeah, it's about hospitality. And when they would see me walking into the village as a very dirty, uh, very smelly man with a very big backpack, their first reaction was, get this man a cup of tea. And so my reaction always was I would walk into a village and within five minutes, people would be offering me a cup of tea. And within 10 minutes, they'd be offering me a place to sleep, you know. And that's completely different than if you arrive in a village with a bus load of people. You know, 25 or 30 people get off the bus. Everybody goes to the tea stall. They have a cup of tea. But they really don't have much interaction with the local people because their interaction is amongst each other. So for me, it was a great advantage because people always wanted to shower me with hospitality. But secondly, people wanted to speak to me. And um, I think one of the great strengths of the book uh, is that I did meet so many people. And, you know, as you know from reading the book, Alvira, 99% of those, 99.9% .9 of those interactions were extremely positive. And not only that, but I learned so much from it. You know, a big part of this trek, as you know, Elvira, from reading the book, you know, I went into this trek with initial motivations being that I would be the first person to do this or that. But as the trek went on, I realized that something else was happening. And that was a, that was a, 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 a you know, a mental sense, a psychological sense that something special was going on. And the drivers for that were my state of mind, uh, the walking that I was doing, because I was walking 30 to 40 kilometers every day with a 25 kilogram pack at high altitude. And then being in this particularly inspirational landscape. And all of that did something to start loosening me up and becoming more open to what was happening around me. You know, if, if I had just been walking uh, 30 kilometers a day around the streets of my hometown, you know, I definitely wouldn't have had the same experience. But I was in what was a completely alien environment. And I was in a completely inspirational environment because of the beauty of those mountains. And, you know, this, this goes back to pilgrimage, the idea of pilgrimage, you know. And uh, really, a pilgrimage at its most basic sense is the idea of a person moving out of their, their comfort area, their home base, moving towards a goal, you know, most of you think of pilgrimage being a spiritual goal. You know, you might be going to Mount Kailash or going to Mecca or, um, you know, going to Santiago de Compostela. You have this goal in mind. You, you start moving towards that goal. And on the way, life puts all of these obstacles in your way, physical and psychological obstacles that you have to overcome. And in each of these cases, when you're faced with those obstacles and you overcome them, you learn from that and you integrate that knowledge back into your, your cache of personal knowledge. Finally, you reach that point, that point that you've been aiming towards, that point of spiritual enlightenment. But then, you know, your task is to come back out and be able to transfer that knowledge back to the people in your, in your home area. Again, you're a changed person. And you have to be able to convey that knowledge that you've garnered along the way to the people who are asking you these questions. 
So in a way, that's how this trek developed. It developed as a trek towards something that at the start, I didn't realize what it was. And even by the end, I didn't necessarily know what it was. It was in the process, the therapy, of writing this book, that I understood really what it was all about. Very true, sir. From your book, uh, the word pilgrimage is actually we mean that we are in attainment of peace. Like we have to attain peace. So that is why we call it that journey of pilgrimage, you know. So that mm -hmm. is what I understood from your book. Uh, also, you could walk and we were, when you're, when you're talking about walking 30 to 40 kilometers, uh, it would have definitely been therapeutic for you to continue it to that extent. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, my, my last book is all about the, the creative power of walking, how human beings, us as human beings, we've been walking for 4 million years. You know, we've only been driving cars and jumping in trains and planes for a hundred years. You know, 99.9999999999% of our history, of our locomotive history, is based around walking. And a particular type of mindset starts to develop when you walk. And, Alvira, you'll know from your psychology practice that lots and lots of psychologists recommend people to walk and why is that it's because it changes the way that we think it actually opens us up in a particular way to new ideas and new feelings and new ways of considering old and new problems but of course i didn't understand that when i started this trek but what i understand now is that the process of walking is, was a catalyst in helping me understand the deep-seated issues that I had myself. Yeah, basically, walking has many physiological and psychological uh, uh, benefits to it. The most, uh, you know, common one being it lowers your stress level. So this is something I was going to talk to you. What has uh, look, the journey, the journey of walking around, trekking around Himalayas, how has it benefited you as a person, both physiologically and psychologically? Oh, well, I think the physiological benefits may <laughs> may now, may not be quite as, as grand as what they were when I undertook the trek. Um, what, but but the, the, what it's given me is it's reinforced, first of all, my love of walking. Um, and secondly, it became the catalyst, first of all, of course, for me uh, to put into context and to come to terms with the death of my younger brother. But secondly, it became a catalyst for, for me to investigate, investigate this, um, you know, this power of walking that, uh, the psychological power of walking that so few people have actually had a chance to investigate. And I mean, that's that's what I wrote my PhD on. That was about the, the relationship between walking and creativity. So walking, you know, the, the trek itself, um, you know, it, 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 the, you know, psychologically, of course, it was incredibly important for me. I mean, I I think of that walk as kind of a watershed moment in my life. You know, my life had reached a very low point before that. You know, the reason that I came to India, the reason I went to the Himalayas is because after my brother died, my, and the audience doesn't know this, but my brother died in a tragic boating accident in Canada. He was only 18 years old at the time, so it was that was a huge, huge loss for myself and my family and all of his friends. And for me after that, for a couple of years, it was, you know, I had a lot of, I had, I had lots of problems, you know, as many people do after they lose a loved one like that in a tragic accident. And I had to, you know, I had to, to, after I reached the bottom of what I call that downward spiral, I needed something to break me out of that cycle. And, you know, I was fortunate in that when I was uh, a little boy, my mum, used to bring us to the library in Belfast every Saturday. And we would all get our books for the week. 
And I would always go and look at these mountaineering books that were very popular in the 1970s and 1980s. And um, in the center of those books, there was always these color pictures of mountaineers up in the Himalayas. And, you know, it was for me looking at those, looking at those men and women in these brightly colored down jackets in this incredibly crisp and clear environment with bright snow all around and beautiful blue skies and endless peaks going out behind them. You know, I grew up, I grew up in a war zone in Northern Ireland. And, you know, Belfast is a very gray and dreary city. And on top of that, there was a lot of psychological compression that comes with living in a war zone like that. So those pictures for me were something that uh, really gave me inspiration. You know, as even as a little boy, I really wanted to go to the Himalayas. And so when, you know, when Gareth died and I dropped into that downward spiral, you know, booze and drugs and failed relationships, the vision of the Himalayas is what became the catalyst to break me out of that. And that's what brought me to India and eventually to Ladakh. And, um, you know, I, I honestly, I fell in love with that place. Uh, I still consider it my second home. I love Ladakh and I still have lots of friends there. And, you know, I was, I was a trekker. So what better place to be? And so I went there for one season of trekking and I ended up spending eight years on and off in Ladakh. And, um, you know, that time, that time culminated, of course, in this very long trek that we're talking about today. And that walk I consider to be one of the one of the watershed moments in my life. It's something it's something that I go back to actually. You know, I still I mean I'm very fortunate, Alvira, in that I was able to write that. Uh, and write what I consider to be a good book <laughs> about, about that track. I was that, about to come to that. That was my next question. You know, when we travel, we write it, we uh, journalize it. We record our journey. We journalize it in a form of travelogue or something. What made you decide on writing a book and then publishing it? I, I can see uh, your inclination well, towards reading and writing right from uh, the experience you shared from your childhood about uh, reading books from the library and, you know, your trips to the well, library. But well, uh, there would be certainly a moment of, you know, uh, decision making, you know, I have to publish my book. What was it? Well, you know, not everybody, lots of people can write a book, but not everybody can publish a book, <laughs> Elvira, as you know. I've been there, so I'm doing that currently. <laughs> so that's, that can be a bit tricky. Everybody has the capacity to write a book or tell a good story. Um, now, initially, of course, I thought that this, this book and this story was going to be about my trek. I mean, I started this trek thinking that I was going to write a book about it again because I idolized those those great mountaineers from the 70s and the 80s who had written books that had inspired me. But something, you know, when I was on the trek, as I said, something magical was happening. And that was something that was very different than what those mountaineers experienced when they were climbing in the Himalayas because this is a, and I didn't realize that at the time but it's a very different experience if you're right. climbing an 8,000 meter peak you know you're in a team and that team of people is generally from your own culture and you're completely focused on that peak for me it was it was much different you know I was alone and I was interacting with people in the Himalayas all the time I was on Yatra Right? I mean, Yatra is very different than climbing. <laughs> and so when I, when I finally finished the trek, of course, I wanted to write a book about it. So I, went, I actually went to Dharmasala in Himachal, and I was there for three months. And I had I'd taken lots and lots of notes from the trek, many, many books. And I translated those into an initial manuscript, the draft manuscript. And I remember it took me, it took me two or three months. And I remember when I finished that, I was very proud of myself. And I went off 
and I had a few beers, and then I came back a couple of days later to read through the manuscript and start the editing process, and I remember reading through it and thinking to myself, oh my God, this is awful. This is a piece of crap, and no one's going to read this, and no one's going to publish it. And what had happened was <clears throat> that I had, I had written a guidebook, and that guidebook was how to walk alone 2,700 kilometers across the Western Himalayas. And, you know, there's not many people who are actually going to do that trek again. So, so there was no audience for this book. But more frustrating for me was the fact that I have, as I said, magic happened every day on this walk. And none of what I've written in that first draft really captured the magic of what had happened. What I'd written was, you know, where to camp at night and what to cook and what equipment you needed and how far it was between each of the camps. And so as a storyteller, that was very frustrating. There was no magic in that manuscript. So I had to I had to find where did this magic come from? What was it what was what did it come out of? And so that's why the book took so long to write, you know, because then I went back and did another draft of the manuscript looking at um, looking at the culture of the Himalayas. So, you know, you have the, the Muslim Himalayas, the Buddhist Himalayas, and the Hindu Himalayas. And, of course, I had to incorporate all of that. So I spent years researching them and then writing another draft. But it still didn't capture all of those moments that I felt. And so I realized, okay, well, it must be something to do with the religions. So I went back and researched the different religions, another draft, another reading, and thinking, well, it's getting better, but it's still not there. So then it must be it must be the spiritual landscapes of the Himalayas because, you know, you have the Kardam Yatra in, in Uttarachal, you have incredible pilgrimage sites in the Buddhist Himalayas, and you have incredibly deep uh, Sunni Shia cultures in Pakistan. Again, you know, another drop, another was happening. So what happened at that point? I was living in Kathmandu, and I remember giving the draft, uh, that draft manuscript to a friend who was an editor. <laughs> she read through it. And uh, she called me after a couple days and said, well, let's go have dinner and we'll talk about your manuscript. And we sat down and, you know, what, what, what came out, what she was saying was that she thought there was another story going on behind what I'd written. And I hadn't been able to tap into that. And, you know, I, I, I didn't believe it because I'd invested so much time, you know, years, almost a decade at this point, deeply immersed in the Himalayas, in the culture, the religion, the flora, the fauna, the geology, the meteorology, the sacred landscapes, and all of that had been incorporated into this book. And what I created was a very layered biography of those great mountains. But, you know, a couple of days after that, I was sitting in my hotel room in Kathmandu, and I just, I had just finished uh, editing the section of the book where I reached the source of the Ganga. And uh, as many of the audience will know, of course, Ganga emanates from the base of Galmuk Glacier, close to Gangotri. And I remember, I remember arriving there just, just as the sun was setting, actually. So there was this beautiful ruby colored sky behind the glacier and the, the massive snow peak on either side were this incredible glowing color and the face of the glacier as as many people will know the turquoise glacial ice is a turquoise color and so i was moving into the turquoise and coral landscape and the the protective stones that every Tibetan child receives are turquoise and coral. So I made this this relationship. I was actually moving into a protective landscape, and I wanted to get to the source of that amazing river before the sun set. So I started running up the glacier, jumping between these boulders. And of course, there was no one there. This was now late in October, and pilgrimage season had finished over a month before. So I was only the first in there. 
and I arrived at the source of the Ganga just as the sun set. And it was it was it was amazing. It was beautiful. I just sat on this stony beach watching the river emanate from this glacial cave. And thinking to myself, wow, you know, this is the land of the sadhus. This is the land of the renunciates. This is the land where people come to feel the change, to feel the movement towards a higher state of consciousness. And I'm sitting there quietly, and I feel this energy rising up my spine. And all of a sudden, I was crying. And I, was, I wasn't surprised by that welling up of emotion because... Because I, at that point, I attributed it to the fact that I was at the start of this incredible piece of landscape, one of the one of the key points of Hinduism, and so I settled with that. But then, years later, when I was sitting in that hotel room in Kathmandu, and and I was meditating on that moment again, and I was coming out of that meditation, and I had a sense of déjà vu. I had a sense that I'd been there before, and it was something related to the, the, that particular that particular temperature that you get. You know, it was freezing cold, and there but there was no wind. I was four thousand five hundred meters up in the Himalayas, and there was no wind. And there was that particular beautiful half light that you get as the sun goes down. And then all of a sudden, I realized the last time that I had had those confluence of feelings, that particular light, that particular temperature, that particular stillness, was when I had seen my brother's body in a hospital ward in Canada. And then, of course, the, the fireworks went off, and I realized, I realized that, of course, the reason that I'd spent eight years in the Himalayas, and the reason that I'd walked alone across the western himalayas wasn't wasn't just about being the first person to do this and that it wasn't about me trying to understand the himalayas and understand islam and buddhism and hinduism it was really about that that universal switch that we all have to face, which is the coming to death of a loved one and when i made that realization then of course I had to go back to the manuscript and rewrite it again. And that's why now that manuscript, as you know, Elvir, includes a lot of references to my little brother and times that we spent together. And the incredible thing was that when I went back and I found those points of magic and I related them back to situations that Gareth and I had spent together, you know, that's when, that's when it really became a story, a universal story. So, it's a very long answer to your original question, which was, you know, we're all, you know, we all have drills, and we all have, we're all creating travel logs. But actually, to create a work that, that will help people, that will keep people engaged and will add some depth to other people's lives is really the challenge of, of a writer, you know, as opposed to a traveler. So it was that realization that this journey for me had the potential to assist others that changed me, that transformed me from, you know, a travel doodler into a real writer someone someone who had something to say because that's actually at the base of what it is to be a writer you have to feel that you have something to say and then you need the skills to be able to convey that to the public in in an engaging way Definitely, sir. Your work definitely had a deeper uh, meaning to it. Something which you understood later in life, but it was always supposed to be that way, right? Mm -hmm. You going on a trek and you understanding this phase of your life and healing towards it. Now, this is what I mean by writing to heal, you know? Yeah. You have written it for someone to uh, gain from that journey. That is the reason I mentioned it uh, right in the start of the session, that by this session, many people will be able to come up with the loss of their loved ones. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they'll heal through this book. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is such a relief, you know, 
all these years of struggle of writing manuscripts getting it you know uh, you yourself rejecting them or getting it checked from people and then finalizing them and it takes courage to publish a book you know oh as you rightly God. said that uh, anyone can write but not everyone publishes it yeah <laughs> so it is uh, such a relief that you know i can only imagine that one piece of the puzzle uh, was you know missing and you you know connected with it and the way the emotions flow anyone who reads this book will understand that it has been written uh, rightly from the heart as the uh, you know title says and it has been written beautifully sir oh, thank you very much now i should say though alvira that um you know i want to stress that anybody who writes it's an important piece of writing as you know as a professional you know uh, that the ability for us to be able to put our thoughts and feelings down on paper by giving it that 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 concrete element by physicalizing it you know it gives us a way to tap into those emotions and memories that we need to understand to move forward in life um and so it, I, i think it's very important you know i think the whole journaling process is very important um that doesn't mean that everybody else wants to read your journals though <laughs> so everyone has their journey and uh, very rightly said that uh, when uh, because as a psychologist when people come to therapy for me i ask them to write their emotions down you know mm -hmm. when you put it on paper you are literally sharing it with someone mm -hmm. someone with uh, who is not judgmental you know who won't talk back to you so that acts as a therapy itself and when you you know share it with people even they can ex uh, take that experience from your uh, writing absolutely so, absolutely yeah very well so it's so uh you know i had this question again as a psychologist uh when you do something for a long period of time it becomes kind of a habit you yeah. know uh, we've been in lockdown since a long period of time okay if i am to compare your 8 years with our 8 months i i am supposed uh, you know i have been uh, kind of in my comfort zone <laughs> getting ready going out socializing is not my cup of tea anymore you know i have to take efforts for it yeah and you were somewhere out there in the himalayas all alone you were only interacting with the local lights you know uh, mostly but how has it affected your social life back home were you you know the same you or have you changed what kind of experience was it well no honestly um uh, you know that experience changed me and um you know it, it uh well two things changed me of course my, the death of my brother made me reconsider life completely um and then uh so you know when i was when i was a younger man uh, my my goal was to uh, go to the olympics and ski race and become rich and uh, you know marry a beautiful woman uh, <laughs> I, i managed to marry marry a beautiful woman <laughs> but uh, uh, the the difference is that you know after my brother died i realized that those are all really superficial goals in a way and um you know I, i mean i spent eight years in ladakh you know i studied buddhism for a long time and i became very conscious that the way that we gain um the way that we 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 gain traction in the world the way that we really project ourselves and make the world a better place is through compassion and so that's why that's why one of the reasons why this book ended up the way it is it's a book that i think can help other people you know i spent years working for medecins sans frontieres working in war zones across africa and in asia helping people who were uh you know without medical care and um you know i mean i have to say that i've lived an extremely lucky life uh you know a person who has been able to achieve goals that i never knew that i had <laughs> and 
you know, and now here I am. Um, you know, I'm, I married a lovely lady. I have two amazing children. Uh, you know, I have a great job here with the National Museum of Australia, which my job is to tell stories through objects, meet interested people. You know, I am such a blessed person. And that probably wouldn't have happened if I had tried to follow those original goals that I had. So with that, I am completely blessed by my brother's memory. And um, yeah, I hope that I hope that if people get to read the book, then they will be able to feel that too. Definitely, I, I would recommend uh, this book to everyone, especially in this phase of life, where everyone in particular around the world have been, you know, mourning the loss of their loved ones due to COVID. Uh, it has been a very unfortunate situation, and anyone who will, who is going through this phase would definitely gain a lot from your book. You know, uh, by reading, I was literally getting goosebumps. It was like I was experiencing the same situation. Oh. Uh, I I definitely feel that people would uh, you know get inspired from your way of coping with grief and get heal and choose a part similar similar whatever they can. Mm. Not everyone can travel to the Himalayas definitely, <laughs> but the book itself is a very major part of the healing process. So. Absolutely. Uh, I I I have to conclude the session. Uh, I just, uh, you know, I can go on and on with my questions for you because uh, it has been a uh, great conversation, sir. It has been a really valuable uh, session and I'm definitely taking home some of uh, the greatest lessons of life that I've, uh, uh, you know, learned today from you. And thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. Oh, Namaskar, Namaskar. Thank Namaskar. You. of Orange City Literature Festival, we sincerely express our gratitude towards the acceptance for the session and knowledge shared with us. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the lovely Thank session. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Namaste. <laughs>